Hi history lovers and welcome or welcome back to the channel where I bring you new videos every week on all aspects of the past. In this latest addition to my playlist on the Six Wives of Henry VIII, which I'll leave linked on screen and below for you, I'm doing a follow-up video to my documentary on the funeral of Anne of Cleves by looking at the dying wishes of this former Queen of England as expressed within her last will and testament. Stick with me to learn what Anne considered to be her most prized possessions and who she left them to, how she treated her servants and the poor who lived in the vicinity of her many houses, the friends she'd made in England after Henry VIII dumped her in 1540, and what objects she left to her former stepdaughters Mary and Elizabeth Tudor. I'll also show you an up-to-date photograph of her tomb in Westminster Abbey, and if you stay till the end, I'll explain the striking omission in her will. To learn more about the Tudors, English royalty and history in general, please remember to subscribe to this channel with notifications switched on so that YouTube lets you know every time I upload. It would be great if you could give this video a like too and follow me on Instagram. I've left a link for that in the description box below along with links to some books, movies and TV shows about Anne's life. Anne of Cleves was the fourth wife of Henry VIII, and though their marriage lasted only six months before he abandoned her in favour of her teenage lady-in-waiting, Catherine Howard, such is the fascination with this king and his spouses that her brief union with him has arguably made her one of the most famous queens in history. Finding herself single again at the age of 24 and banned from leaving England under the terms of the annulment agreement which dissolved her marriage, and lived out the rest of her days in her adopted country, having been given the courtesy title of the King's Sister. She died aged 41 on the 16th of July 1557 at Chelsea Manor in London. If you see my video on whether she was Henry's luckiest wife, it will provide you with a much fuller biography of this one-time Queen of England. But for now, let's focus on the legal preparations made just before her death. We don't know what Anne died of, but as the last will and testament we're going to look at states, she'd been ill for some time and cancer has been suggested as a possible cause of death. Of all the king's wives, she was the only one to make a formal written will. This option was not usually open to a married woman as her belongings were her husband's, and although Henry's first wife, Catherine of Aragon, had also seen her marriage annulled by Henry, Unlike Anne, she had refused to accept this and still considered herself his wife. This left her, in her eyes at least, unable to make an official last will and testament, though she did make written requests in final letters sent to Henry and the imperial ambassador that wages and gifts would be given to her servants. In a similar position was wife number six, Catherine Parr, who had remarried after Henry's death and who requested, as she lay dying in 1548, that all her possessions go to her new husband, Thomas Seymour, though this was a bit moot as he would have inherited anyway. Wife number three, Jane Seymour, was still married to Henry at the time of her death, so she left no will. Wives two and five, Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard, were executed for treason, so it is hardly surprising that they made no wills either. Anne of Cleves, then, was in a unique position amongst Henry's queens. By the time of her death, she had outlived all of them, as well as Henry himself, and was the third lady in the kingdom after Queen Mary I and Mary's half-sister, who was then known as the Lady Elizabeth. She was also very wealthy. Henry, in his relief at how easily she'd accepted the annulment of their marriage, had settled a fortune on her by way of homes, goods, and a huge income of between £3,000 and £4,000 per year. And despite complaints during the final portion of her life that money was tight, as we'll see from the details of her will, poor is a relative term, and in fact the king had seen to it that Anne had a great deal of money and possessions at her disposal, and a huge household full of servants to leave much of them to. She'd also built up an impressive social network in England, and the bequests she made indicate who her friends there were. The will is dated the 12th and 15th of July 1557, indicating that it was written between those dates and that it was only around four days before her death that Anne realised that whatever was wrong with her, she wasn't going to recover from it. It opens with a brief discussion of what had occasioned its writing and what Anne wanted done with her remains. She noted that she was, quote, sick in body but whole in mind and memory, and left her soul to 
the Holy Trinity and our body to be buried where it shall please God. Later in the will, though, she specified that she should be buried wherever Queen Mary thought best, and asked that she may have the suffrages of the Holy Church according to the Catholic faith wherein we end our life in this transitory world. If you've seen my video on her funeral, you'll know that Mary obliged. Anne was given a large and expensive Catholic funeral prior to her interment here in Westminster Abbey, where she now lies about a 20-second walk from Mary and Elizabeth's joint resting place. Her grave is on the south side of the high altar, with the reverse side being the only bit you can walk right up to, though it's quite easy to miss because it's almost completely hidden by other monuments. The monument itself was never finished, and the inscription you can see in my modern photograph was added in the 1970s. Her burial aside, most of the will covers financial matters. Anne asked first and foremost that her executors would petition Queen Mary to ensure that her outstanding debts were paid. She also requested that the Queen allow those executors to bring in the money from her estates up to and including Michaelmas 1557, which was on the 29th of September, so that that money could be put towards the payment of debts. Additional money was to be raised to cover these expenses by the sale of any plate, jewels, robes and cattle not bequeathed elsewhere. Such money was also to be put towards her funeral costs and the payment of legacies left to individuals, of which there were many. In fact, most of the document contains such bequests. These can be broken up into four sections. What Anne left to her servants, her charitable donations, what she left to her friends, and what she left to her family. These groups aren't always recorded together, and instead one gets the impression that as Anne remembered additional gifts she wanted to leave someone, they were added to the growing list. For her servants, she left one year's wages, from the 1st of July 1557 to the 1st of July 1558. There were also specific legacies for all 18 of her gentlewomen. Of these, two were left £100 each as marriage portions, a hefty sum for a mere servant, and another, named only as Mother Lovell, was gifted 40 shillings, quote, for her attendance upon us in this time of this our sickness. The rest were left between £10 each and the oddly specific sum of £66, 13 shillings and 4 pence, which went to Catherine Char and her daughter Anne. This is so specific, in fact, that I wonder if it included outstanding wages. As well as her women, Anne remembered the men and children of her household too. In addition to the year's wages already left to them, the eight gentlemen who attended on her daily were bequeathed £10 each, while her grooms and yeomen were all to receive 40 shillings. Her cofferer, Thomas Pierce, he's the man who'll have taken care of her money for her, plus her clerk comptroller and the clerk of her kitchen got the same amount. But there was an extra four pounds for John Gulick, who was a servant from home. In fact, Anne showed a special care for all her foreign servants, whether they were still in her employ or not, mindful of the fact that with her dead, they might have little reason to remain in England. Listing eight of them, she bequeathed 40 shillings to each in order to defray their travel expenses in leaving. Another 20 shillings per head was to go to, quote, every of our children of our house. A former laundress, Ellen Turpin, was left four pounds to pray for Anne's soul. Her doctor, John Simmons, and surgeon, Alan Blonde, were left £20 and £4 respectively, with special mention made of Simmons' quote, great pains, labours and travails taken oftentimes with us. She was concerned too that her servants be able to wear mourning for her, and left the officers of her household, her gentlemen waiters and her gentlewomen, quote, so much black cloth as will make every of them a gown with the hood and coat. This cloth was to cost 13 shillings, 4 pence per yard. Two yards each of cheaper cloth, costing 9 shillings, was designated for all of her yeomen, grooms and the children of her household. Anne was not to suffer the indignity of being unmourned by her own servants. Next we have the charitable bequests. These consisted of 40 shillings per child for the education of all of the alms children under Anne's jurisdiction as a landowner, plus four pounds a head, quote, unto all the poor people in Richmond, Bletchingley, Hever and Dartford, all places where Anne either had or had previously had homes. Richmond Palace and the manor at Bletchingley, by the way, had been part of her annulment settlement, but soon after Henry's death, the minority council, which ruled for his son, Edward VI, 
had forced her to swap them for Penshurst Manor and Dartford Priory in Kent. This money was to be delivered by the church wardens of those parishes, quote, by the advice and in the presence of one of our servants thereabouts dwelling. I'd love to know if it actually made it to its intended recipients, but sadly I don't have that information. Even Anne seems to have been worried that some of her instructions might not be followed, especially with regards to her servants, for she asked that the Queen would, quote, be our overseer of this our said last will and testament, and included a fascinating little throwback to the arrangements made for her after the annulment to help persuade Mary to do this, saying that she beseeched her former stepdaughter to ensure that our poor servants may enjoy such small gifts and grants as we have made unto them in consideration of their long service done unto us, being so appointed to do at the first erection of our house by Her Majesty's late father of most famous memory, King Henry the Eighth. For that His Majesty said then unto us that he would account our servants his own, and their service to us done as to His Highness. We can only hope that the current Queen received the former Queen's message and ensured that Anne's wishes were carried out. Next we have the executors of Anne's will, whose efforts Mary was to oversee, and who I'd like to think Anne counted amongst her friends. These were Nicholas Heath, who was the Archbishop of York and Lord Chancellor of England, Henry Earl of Arundel, Sir Edmund Peckham and Sir Richard Freestone. For their trouble in handling her will, Anne left Heath a fair bowl of gold with a cover, while Lord Arundel was to receive a maudlin standing cup of gold with a cover. For Sir Edmund there was a jug of gold with a cover or a crystal glass garnished with gold and set with stone, and for Sir Richard there was our best gilt bowl with a cover, or else that piece of gold plate which Mr. Peckham leaveth if it be his pleasure. Already we can see that Anne was indeed very wealthy. She had income from her lands, a household full of servants, and plenty of high-status goods made of gold and crystal which could be left to specified individuals. The bequests made to her favourite friends and family only emphasise this impression of wealth, but they differ from what was left to her servants and executors. While servants got money and cloth for mourning clothes, which was very nice for them I'm sure, but quite impersonal, executors got the more valuable golden cups, plates and bowls that Anne would have used in daily life. Furthermore, as we're about to see, for family and those friends who were apparently closest to her, it was jewellery all the way, as Anne left to them items she would have actually worn herself and which were studded with precious gems, making them the most expensive objects and showing her high regard, or at least respect, for those to whom she left them. Anne had obviously befriended Catherine Willoughby, Dowager Duchess of Suffolk, and widow of Henry VIII's great favourite Charles Brandon, for she left the Duchess a ring of gold having therein a fair table diamond somewhat long. The Countess of Arundel, wife of one of Anne's executors, was to receive a ring of gold with a fair table diamond having an H and an I of gold set under the stone. I wish I knew who the H and I initials referenced, but the will doesn't explain that. It's tempting to say that the H was for Henry, but I really don't know. For the Lord Privy Seal, Lord Paget, there was another gold ring, this time with a three-cornered diamond set into it. Now we get to Anne's family. For her cousin, the Count of Waldeck, there was a gold ring with a fair great hollow ruby. Annoyingly though, I couldn't be sure of how this cousin was related to her. I suspect it was through her paternal grandfather, but as I couldn't find a reliable source to explain the relationship, I've left him off this particular family tree. Her sister-in-law, the Duchess of Cleves, who was married to Anne's brother William, received something similar, a black enameled ring containing a great rock ruby. Closer blood relations and her former stepdaughters got the choicest items. Anne's sister Amalia, also called Amelia or Emily, was left a gold ring containing a fair pointed diamond. Their brother, Duke William, was to receive another gold ring containing a heart-shaped diamond with sundry square cuts in the same, which I think means there were additional diamonds in the ring. Perhaps unsurprisingly, given that she was living in England, hadn't seen her siblings for many years, and wouldn't have wanted to offend her Tudor family, Anne left Queen Mary her best jewel as a remembrance of her former stepmother. The Lady Elizabeth got her second best. This distinction between the sisters will have been a nod to their difference in age and status, and I wouldn't read it as a mark of favouritism for Mary. 
Anne also asked that Elizabeth take in one of her servants, named Dorothy Curzon, which I think shows the high esteem she held Henry's younger daughter in. She obviously trusted Elizabeth to take care of one of her favoured servants, and I say favoured because Dorothy was the only person who she sought a new position for, and was also one of the women given a £100 marriage portion. The will doesn't specify what the first and second best jewels actually looked like, so I think we must assume that it was obvious, just looking at Anne's collection, what the two best items in it were. To finish up, as promised, I'd like to draw your attention to what isn't in the will, and that's Anne's houses and their furnishings. All of these, and I think the most famous is Hever Castle, which had previously been the home of Anne Boleyn, were only hers for life, and so the reason they aren't in her will is that they reverted to the crown upon her death. With her last will and testament made, signed and witnessed by a large number of Anne's household servants, she quickly passed away. The will was probated in London on the 2nd of September, just a few weeks after her burial, and we are left to guess how many of Anne's bequests actually made it to their intended recipients, but hopefully most, if not all of them, did. If you'd like to learn more about this former Queen's life and death, try one of these videos next. And let me know below what you think her will tells us about her as a person and her life after Henry. I'll be back next week with a new video, and until then, keep learning.